fits into work, power, and efficiency. 2.1. Work. In previous videos, we developed an analogy for energy. Using energy is like money to help us understand the abstract concept which is energy. When we looked at this analogy, we looked at the definition of money as the ability to buy stuff. It's not a great definition, but it's hard to define money, and perhaps defining it based on what it's used for helps it to be more understandable. Now, when you think about money, you think about where you keep your money. In this case, we're going to consider your bank account. Your bank account is divided into your savings, the money you're putting away for later, and your checking, which is the money that you have available to buy stuff with. You can change money back and forth between your savings and your checking, and your savings and your checking combine to create your total amount of money. Now, sometimes you get paid, and that's how money enters your bank account. In this case, we would call it positive money, a gain of money. Sometimes you buy stuff, and money leaves your bank account. This loss of money is negative money. Either way, we have a change of money. Your bank account is not isolated. It's not just sitting there um, holding your money. You use it to buy stuff and you get paid. Money enters and money exits. That's the idea of a non-isolated system. We can also consider the same situation for energy. Energy is the ability to do work. It's not a great definition for energy, but defining it based on what it's used for helps us understand. Instead of a bank account, we're going to consider the idea of a system. System is divided into its potential energy and its kinetic energy, which add to create your total energy. It's a non-isolated system, which means that you can have a gain of energy, which is positive energy added to the system, and this might happen due to a force being exerted on the system. A force like a push, or pull, or if it's an engine, you have a thrusting force. You can also have a loss of energy if it's a non-isolated system. This is negative energy. This might be due to forces such as friction, air drag, or heat. This change in energy in a non-isolated system is referred to as work. And so when we say energy is the ability to do work, what we really mean is energy is the ability to change energy. In a non-isolated system, a change in energy is called work. Or work is equal to delta energy. Delta, the little triangle there, means change in. Work is measured in joules and energy is measured in joules because work is just another kind of energy. And the formula we use is work equals delta E. For example, a 5 kilogram box is lifted from a 1.2 meter high shelf to a 1.7 meter high shelf. How much work was done? The initial potential energy of the box when it was on the 1.2 meter high shelf was mg times this height, which is 5 times 9.81 times 1.2. This has, it gives us an initial potential energy of 58.86 joules. Later the box is lifted and we get a final potential energy. 
The final potential energy is equal to mg times the final h, which is 5 times 9.81 times 1.7, which is 83.385 joules. Since work is equal to a change in energy, this change in potential energy results in work. This is EP final minus EP initial, which is 83.385 minus 58.86. This gives us work equals 25 joules. When work is done, there is always a transfer of force. Energy might be added to the system as force is exerted on the system, or energy might leave the system as the system exerts force on another object. We have a second formula for work, which is work equals F D cos theta. In this formula, W stands for work, which is measured in joules. F is force, which is measured in newtons, and D is displacement, which is measured in meters. It's important to note that this force here is the net force on the object, the total of all the forces combined. Theta is the angle between the force and the displacement. For example, a suitcase is pulled with a force of 300 newtons at an angle 20 degrees above the horizontal. over a displacement of 7.2 meters forward. How much work is done? So we have this suitcase being pulled at an upward angle of 300 newtons, 20 degrees above the horizontal. The suitcase travels a displacement of 7.2 meters. Work is force times distance times cos theta where it's 300 newtons times 7.2 meters times cos 20, which is the angle between them. This gives us work equal to 2.0 times 10 to the 3 joules. If the force and displacement are in the same direction, that is to say the object goes in the exact direction that it's pushed, then the angle between them is zero. When this happens, for example, we have an object being pushed with a force and it travels a distance in the same direction as that force, and theta is zero. We get work equals force times distance times cos theta, which is F D cos zero, and cosine of zero equals one. This makes it easier. We just have work equals force times distance in this situation. For example, a box is pulled by a rope parallel to the floor over a distance of 35 meters. The tension in the rope is 35 newtons and, the and friction opposes the motion with 10 newtons of force. How much work was done? F net is the force of tension minus the force of friction. This is 25 newtons forward. So the box is being pulled by the rope with a net force of 25 newtons, traveling the same direction for its displacement of 35 meters. 
we can just use work equals force times distance since they're both pointing in the same direction. This is 25 times 35, which gives us work equals 8.8 .8 times 10 to the 2 joules. Two point two power and efficiency. We've already learned that work is a change in energy. This change in energy means that energy either enters or leaves the system. It can also be thought of as a transfer of energy from one system or the outer system, the surroundings, into the system. Machines and devices do work by using input energy To complete a task. So this is our machine. It's a system within itself. From the outside, energy is input into the machine. This might be electrical energy or it could be chemical energy. And there's an output energy as a result of the machine performing its task. Power is a measurement of how quickly a machine uses its energy. The formula we use for power is power equals work divided by time. P equals W over T, or it could also be written as P equals delta E over T. In each of these formulas, they mean the same thing. P is power, which is measured with the unit watts, or W. Don't mix up the W of watts with the W of work. Work is measured in joules. T is time, which is measured in seconds. Example, a 60 watt light bulb is left on for four hours. How much input energy does it use? Power is change in energy over time. This means we can rearrange the formula to find energy by multiplying power and time. Our power is 60 watts, and our time is 4 hours times 3600 gives us 14400 seconds. So the change in energy is 60 times 14400, which gives us a change in energy of 8.6 times 10 to the 5 joules. It's important to realize how inefficient most machines are. Not all of the 8.6 times 10 to the 5 joules of input energy is actually used to produce light. Maybe you've put your hand on a light bulb before and noticed how hot it becomes. This is because a lot of the energy is lost as waste energy. One example of the waste energy is the heat energy you feel when you touch a light bulb. The efficiency of a machine is a measure of how much of the input energy is actually used to do the machine's purpose.
The formula we use for efficiency is efficiency equals output over input times 100%. The output or input could be a number of things. It could be output energy or input energy. It could be work, output work and input work, or power, output power or input power. Example, when the 60 watt light bulb was left on for four hours, it produces 2.1 times 10 to the four joules of light energy. What is the light bulb's efficiency? Efficiency is output over input times 100%. This is 2.1 times 10 to the 4, the output, divided by the input, which was 8.6 times 10 to the 5, times 100%. This gives us an efficiency for our light bulb of 2.4%. This number may seem very low, but it's actually quite common for an incandescent light bulb. They really are quite inefficient. There is no such thing as a perfect or 100% efficient machine. The goal when we're creating newer machines and new technology is always to increase efficiency. The higher the efficiency is, the better the machine is at using its input to produce its goal. For example, old school technology, the candle had an efficiency of 0.04%. The incandescent light bulb was still quite efficient, but it was better than a candle. It was 2 to 5% efficient. The LED lights are 4.2 to 22% efficient, which is much better. And the new fluorescent light bulbs range from 9 to 15% efficiency.